If we do just want to focus on memorizing, what's the most effective way? Active recall and spaced repetition. You need to repeatedly do the same questions again and again to slow down the forgetting curve, only stopping for the moment once you find the topic to be too easy. There is one flaw to all of this. You don't know what you don't know. Hello, my name is Jack Wang. I'm a microbiologist, science educator, YouTuber, and on this channel, we talk about science, teaching, and careers. I recently made a video going through 50 different study tips in 15 minutes, as well as a follow-up anthology series, Tips Digest walking through these tips at a slower pace. Episode one of the Tips Digest series focused on note-taking and the idea that there is no perfect set of notes. Today, episode two of Tips Digest, we'll talk about the most popular study hack all over the internet, active recall and spaced repetition. Our brains are more likely to retain information when it's trying to retrieve it or recall it. So doing practice exams is the right kind of exercise that nurtures long-term memory. You need to repeatedly do the same questions again and again to slow down the forgetting curve, only stopping for the moment once you find the topic to be too easy. You then focus on the harder topics and space out the time between repeating the same topic, depending on how difficult you find the material to be at that moment in time. You've heard about all of this before, it's all over YouTube. So instead let's talk about how to put it into action. Tip 13, use flashcards. Questions on the front, answers on the back. If you get the answer right, put the card in the easy pile. If you get the answer wrong, put the question in the hard pile. Revise the easy pile once a week. Revise the hard pile once a day. Tip 14, sharing is caring. Share your flashcards with your friends because writing questions, finding answers, and making the cards is very time consuming. So if you can make it a group activity that saves everyone, including yourself, sometimes. Tip 15, consider digital flashcards. Anki is the most popular app for this where you can keep the flashcards on your phone so you can test yourself anywhere, anytime and it also shows you the questions on order based upon when you answered it correctly last. So it's very convenient for built-in spaced repetition. You'll find that these tips about flashcards are all over the net and they are solid. If you're studying a discipline that has a very structured curriculum that doesn't change that much over time, say something like anatomy, then there's likely an enormous test bank of questions or already out there that you can co-opt and use for your own revision. There is one flaw to all of this though. You don't know what you don't know. You may find a set of questions, turn them into flashcards and become very confident in your knowledge. But how would you, as a novice to this field, know if that set of questions is complete? You just don't have the expertise yet to judge if a test bank of questions covers all of the most important concepts. If you did, you wouldn't actually be that confident in any set of questions because you'd always be trying to find or create new questions to fill gaps in your understanding. This is the Dunning-Kruger effect in a nutshell. As people gain more expertise, their self-assessment of their own expertise becomes more contrite and measured. Tip 16, live in the past. Take all the questions you can find from past exams and any relevant parts of the textbook and make each one into a flashcard. This way you can be sure that what you're revising aligns with at least what your professor has tested in the past. Tip 17, the previous tip assumes that you have answers to your past exams, which is a big assumption. So before you start anything, you'll need to form a study group to figure out the answers collaboratively for making your flashcards. These two tips are trying to fill that void left open by our own inexperience when we learn a topic for the very first time. Don't assume any set of questions is everything you might need to know, but instead use them as the starting point to write your own practice questions. When you do this, you're not limited by the confines of any test question set and you're modeling the actions that align with higher order learning, attempting to apply your knowledge towards new situations. But again, you're a beginner. It's not immediately obvious how you would start to write your own questions. Tip 18, don't ask teachers for answers because no teacher wants the answers to their exams leaking online. Try to work out the answers by yourself first and then show it to your teachers to ask for feedback. That's much more productive. Tip 19, convert multiple choice into short answer questions. Normally each multiple choice question has at least four wrong options or distractors and one correct answer. For each of the four distractors, convert it into a short answer question for a flashcard. What's wrong with this option? Is this statement true or false? Can you explain why? Tip 20, swap out key terms in short answer questions and use this to write your own practice questions. For example, if the question is asking you about infections caused by one type of bacteria, swap it out for a different bacteria and try to answer it again. There you have it, some concrete strategies on how to write your own revision questions. Each multiple choice question has four or five answers. Make each answer its own study topic and all of a sudden you've multiplied the number of questions by a factor of four or five. Every short answer question has a set construct or template with a focus on specific key terms. Swap out key terms 
and each construct uses short answer questions becomes a template or a vehicle for any key term relevant to that topic. Tip 21, boredom is your worst enemy when it comes to revision. So you need fresh ways of looking at the same material. Saying the answer out aloud, writing it out on paper, typing it on your computer, anything to keep it fresh. Tip 22, strength in numbers. Revise the friend or a study group online or in person and let your study group keep you accountable and collectively form some good study habits that sets you all up for the long term. As you no doubt experiencing right now, if adrenaline, stress, anxiety, and fear weren't driving you, the whole studying enterprise is repetitive and monotonous. You're actively answering questions over and over again, writing new questions, searching for answers. Anything you can do to keep it fresh and maintain your motivation is super valuable. Connect with others, find new ways of communicating your learning to others. All of it helps bit by bit. Nutrition and sleep are seriously underrated, just like exercise as it relates to memory retention, cognitive processing, but I don't have any tips on managing this. I struggle enough with those things myself. Like everyone else in the world though, I've read Atomic Habits by James Clear and the idea that a small incremental habit can compound and change our lives over a long period of time is very powerful. Tip 23, a taxonomic audit. Using Bloom's taxonomy, go through all the revision questions in your custom test bank. How many of these are just asking you to define and list things because that's raw memorization. So active recall and space repetition and flashcards, they will work just fine. Tip 24, an issue of complexity because if most of your test bank comes from past exams, your auditor should find that many of them are asking you to explain, describe, compare, and contrast, not just define or list. This is no longer memorizing, but higher up on Bloom's taxonomy, understand, apply, evaluate. You'll need new strategies that can establish connections and relationships between the concepts you learn. This is now coming back to the idea of we don't know what we don't know. To assess if your question bank is good enough, you can consider the learning complexity of the questions. At university, it would be very unlikely that your exam is made up entirely of questions that rely on raw memorization. If all of your test bank questions are audited as low level memorization, pretty much you haven't covered all the bases. Time to go back to the drawing board. Tip 25, mind the gap. All the way back in tip three, you learn how to make mind maps that connect the dots between related concepts on a specific topic. Try to remove a node or a branch or a connection and put that incomplete mind map on a flashcard. Answering that question now doesn't rely on pure memorizing of one idea because you need to know how all the pieces fit and how everything's connected to get it right. Tip 26, mix and match. If questions are asking you to compare and contrast two different concepts, Draw a table where each row is comparing similar but different attributes. Remove one term, swap it out with another, put the right term in the wrong place. With just a little bit of extra effort, you can start to build in higher order reasoning into your revision, not just memorizing. These tips are trying to elevate the complexity of learning through flashcards by drawing out connections between different ideas mind maps with a piece missing or a table with a misplaced key term here or there. These are really efficient ways to highlight all the pieces of the puzzle that fit together in your topic. But do rely on you already having a mind map or summary table to begin with. We talked about the transient ever-changing nature of note-taking in episode one about Tips Digest. You can find here or linked below. Tip 27, the Feynman technique or trying to explain the concept to other people. Can you critique people in your study group's explanations of the same concept and add to them constructively? Because this moves you past remembering or memorizing and more into understanding, explaining, or describing. Higher up on Bloom's taxonomy. Tip 28, explain it to yourself. Film or record yourself explaining a difficult concept from memory, from scratch. Do this again and again until you're happy with the recording, showing your complete explanation to your whole study group. Watching and listening to yourself can be a very cringy experience. You can take it from me. So you can also improve your communication skills at the same time. Tip 29, explain it to an outsider. Find a person who doesn't know anything about what you're studying, a friend, a family member, and see if they have any idea what on earth you're talking about. To do this, you'll need to adapt your explanation for different audiences, avoid using technical jargon, and explain things without making assumptions about what they know. This is again, higher up on Bloom's taxonomy. Applying and using information in new contexts. These tips are a distillation of all of my experiences as a teacher of the past 20 years. I didn't know how little I knew about any topic until I started to teach it to other people. Specifically, when I listened back to my own lecture recordings, and cringing not just at the sound of my own voice, but also at the way I was trying to explain complex concepts. Teachers know this phenomenon too well. We learn more than any of our students just by having to do the preparation in anticipation 
of that class of making others understand what we're saying and trying to avoid the dread of people not getting it. We want to make sense and to be understood by a full room of people. And you can use that to your advantage in your study group. If it doesn't make sense to other people, you'll know very quickly. What piece of information was missing? What did you gloss over too quickly that would have connected the pieces together properly? You can use the Feynman technique in different stages of your revision at the beginning to start a whole series of new revision topics that you didn't even know were needed. This is the Biolab Collective, I'm Jack Wayne, and in the final episode of our Tips Digest series for studying, we'll talk through game day exam strategies and different types of exam questions. Hope to see you then.